Hello, I'm Perdita Stevens, and it's a pleasure to give this keynote at the Online Reversible Computation Conference. I should say, when I first got this invitation, one of the reasons I was so pleased about it was that for some years I've been wanting to understand in detail the relationship between reversible computation and bidirectional transformation. People outside both fields often tend to assume that these are two terms for the same thing, but as I'm sure you realise, that's really not the case. I should confess, I have not worked out how to give that talk, so instead I'm going to give a fairly straight, high-level talk about bidirectional transformations and problems and prospects in them as I see them. I'm still interested in that relationship question, so if you've written, or you plan to write in future, the definitive paper about that relationship between reversible computation and bidirectional transformations, please do send me a copy, or if you're interested in collaborating on it, send me an email. So this is a talk in three parts. Let me start off by talking about software engineering and its problems as I see them. In the beginning was the software crisis. You may well be too young to have lived through this 30-year software crisis, which began at the very beginning of software engineering in the 1960s and persisted to the late 1990s. Here is a passage from a Dargstuhl on history of software engineering discussing the fact that the term software crisis was coined at the NATO Software Engineering Conference in 1968 for the phenomenon that it was perceived to be difficult to impossible to build reliably, correct, predictably, correctly, large software systems. And it remained so for the next 30 years because although techniques improved, the demand for software increased just as fast. In passing, let me also say you may well have heard that the term software engineering was coined at those NATO conferences. Indeed, I've said it myself in the past. It's not true. Uh, it turns out that Margaret Hamilton was using the term software engineering several, re several years earlier. The reason you may not have heard of the software crisis before is because the term has been in much less use lately than it was when I first came into software engineering. So I was born about there and I came into software engineering about there. So you can either say the software crisis was all my fault, or you can say that I single-handedly fixed it. Well, let's talk a bit about what the crisis was and why it went away. So the fundamental problem of software engineering, I claim, is that there's just too much stuff. There's too much stuff to know and remember and understand. It exceeds human capacities for remembering and reasoning about. And what this means is that the approaches to the problem that have got us out of the original software crisis are all fundamentally the same idea. They're all ways of getting chunks of processing done within the limited capacity of an individual human brain. So for example, we now have high-level languages we have verification techniques that enable us to focus on abstractions of software systems. We have good uses of interfaces that enable us to do unit testing and separate out bugs within a module from bugs that concern how the module is used. We have, of course, models and model-driven development, which is all about separating concerns. But even things like agile development methods, where you sequentialize the work into bounded small releases, can be seen as a version of this idea. You say, we're not going to worry about all the relevant information for this software system right now. We're going to separate what we need to know right now from what we don't. That's going to enable the humans involved to make progress without being overwhelmed by detail. I sometimes like to say to my students, Imagine that we met the little green aliens from the planet Zog. Would they be able to join our software engineering teams? Would we be able to join their software engineering teams? Well, it doesn't really depend so much on their computers. Those will be Turing powerful just like ours. It depends on their working memory and processing power. So, the software crisis was more or less solved by means of that set of improvements in how we abstract the problem into manageable chunks. Does that mean the problem has gone away? Well, no, because we still have what I'm going to call the software capacity crisis. And it's evidenced by facts like these, that there are hundreds of thousands of unfilled ICT positions in the EU right now. 
One recent estimate was that there are going to be another 1.6 million professional jobs to fill by 2030. Admittedly, that estimate predates the pandemic, so who knows what that will do to it. If you look at the lists that appear from time to time based on surveys of what things worry CEOs of software companies, hiring and their capacity to do the work that they can attract tend to appear at the top. And so you might think that that simply indicates that we need to turn out more and more computer science graduates. However, at least in the UK, the unemployment rate for computer science graduates is higher than that of other STEM subjects. So what's going on? Well, fundamentally, what's going on is that there is demand, but there's only demand for the very best people. There's demand for superhumans. And that is because, although we've got so much better at splitting the overwhelming amount of work into chunks, we still have huge difficulty in reintegrating those chunks. There ain't no such thing as a free lunch, that's what the title there means. So today's techniques, I claim, support individuals in temporarily focusing on one concern, but what they don't do is to free them from the obligation of ever understanding how their concern fits in with other concerns. This has been observed multiple times in different ways. The original Mythical Man Month, identified by Fred Brooks, was all about this. It was about the difficulty of a new person on a software team understanding enough to make a real contribution. Integration has been a perpetual problem. In the bad old days, we had integration phases, and now we have continuous integration, but it's still not that easy. Even in agile development, you have problems that arise from the advantages of separating development into separate sprints which is that if you're not very careful, you accumulate technical debt over those sprints, and then that has to be paid off. And MDE, of course, has many such problems. For example, the difficulties that arise in managing projects that incorporate multiple domain-specific languages, you know, that themselves were introduced in order to help separate concerns. In other words, in practice, models are not independent. This picture is going to come back several times, partly because I have an experiment to see how long I can go, including this picture at least once in every talk I give. The idea is that although we might have separate groups of specialists, these might be user interface designers, um, and these might be safety engineers, their work is not independent. It's possible for them to make decisions which are not compatible and then they have to get together in a meeting or something and work out how to reconcile those problems. So that's the conclusion of part one, which is to say separation of concerns in software engineering is a success story and integration of, of concerns is not a success story yet. So we have lots more work to do on that and that's what we have to do if we are to solve the software capacity crisis. So in part two, I want to talk about bidirectional transformations, which are the means of reintegrating those concerns. Bidirectional transformations are books for short. And full disclosure, bidirectionality is everywhere, at least after you start looking at things that way, and I tend to do that. But what do we mean by bidirectionality? We have a bidirectional situation when we have multiple models which are live but not orthogonal. The job of a bidirectional transformation is to maintain consistency between such models. So let me unpack what I mean by that a bit. First of all, I've slipped into talking about models rather than chunks. Well, what's a model? Well, everything's a model. In the olden days, I used to use a definition like this. I used to say things like, a model is an abstract, usually graphical, representation of some aspect of a system. And this is still true. I'm very glad that I put the word usually in there, which wasn't quite so obvious back in the 1990s. Um, we've been gradually understanding that whether a thing is graphical or textual is not as important as we once used to think it was. Here are some examples. A UML model with boxes and lines is the kind of thing you probably think of when I say a model, but database schemas are also models and special purpose things like maps of users' navigation between screens might be models, but also te textual things such as collections of Java code or a collection of JUnit tests, either of those might also count as a model. So we can alternatively say 
a model supports the work of a particular group of people and ideally, in order to be maximally useful to them, it records all and only the information that they need to do their work. We can say a model is a representation of a concern. And of course that makes it completely clear that having models that having multiple models and having to maintain consistency between them is a consequence of separation of concerns because that consistency maintenance is the reintegration of separated concerns. So models that are live, all we mean by that is that they're not dead yet so they may need to be updated at some time in the future as opposed to the kind of idealised refinement-based development that you probably haven't ever seen for real but may have seen in an undergraduate software engineering course in which you might develop a model, derive a new model from it, throw the new model over the wall and never touch the original again. So for example in principle you might write some tests and then freeze them and write the code so that it passes the tests. Life is not that ideal. Now there's no problem in having several models that are alive if the information that they record is completely independent. And of course that does happen. Here's an example. If you and I are both working collaboratively with some large software system and each of us has available to us a settings screen that allows us to customise certain aspects of the appearance or even the behaviour of the software, then those collections of settings can be seen as models. My collection of settings is my model and your collection of settings is your model. And we expect that those models are entirely independent. My modifying my settings has no effect on you. But more generally, dependencies between models have to be managed somehow. So for example, if we consider a collection of JUnit tests and the collection of Java code that those tests are testing, some changes on one side or the other can be made completely independently. For example, you might be able to refactor the Java changing nothing about its behaviour and you wouldn't expect that to affect the JUnit tests. Other changes might indeed necessitate a change on the other side. If in the Java code I decide to change the name of a method then I probably have to do something on the JUnit side otherwise the test won't even compile with my modified Java. Now there may well be many different ways to restore consistency. So for example, in the case where I've changed the method name on the Java side, I might go and change the method name in the relevant tests on the JUnit side, or I might just delete all the relevant tests. And depending on what notion of consistency I'm using, either of those two things might be a legitimate way to restore consistency. But you might well consider one of those to be more useful than the other. And that's typical of what goes on in this world. So restoring consistency and thinking about such bidirectional situations can get quite complicated. It's helpful to separate the tasks out into two distinct things. First, checking whether all is well, consistency checking. And second, if it's not all well, if consistency has been violated in some way, fixing it. And we have a whole bunch of choices, and they include the following. They include how much to articulate about all is well, and I have an example of that in the JUnit Java case coming up in a moment. Separately, we may also choose how much to automate the consistency restoration. We will have to consider at some stage what kinds of fixes to consider. Do we, for example, insist that only one model is changed or do we allow restoration of consistency that might involve changing both models? What information do we maintain in order to do all this? Do we just have access to the models themselves or do we also have access to some auxiliary information such as traces that might tell us which parts of one model correspond to parts of another or to intentional information about what the user changed about a model? Typically, the more information we have, the more intelligent our choices about how to restore consistency can be. But against that, there's a cost involved in maintaining extra information. The biggest cost being that if you need certain information, then you cannot allow people to edit your models in tools that do not provide that extra information or maintain it suitably. 
the term books is going to be used for a bidirectional transformation, which is an artifact for automating those tasks, either fully or partially. Now, if you fade out, either technically or mentally, over the next dozen slides or so, here's what you need to know in order to rejoin me at part three of this talk. We do not have, and we're not likely to have, one true way to write books, because all of these choices are legitimate choices. There are good reasons for resolving them in different ways. So let's look at some of them in more detail. I said we might have a choice about how much consistency to articulate, so let's think about what all is well might mean for the consistency between a collection of JUnit tests and some Java code. So the least stringent thing we might mean is that the co files compile together without error. Okay. But we might want that, and we might also want to ensure that the JUnit file includes a test for every public method. It includes enough tests, in some sense. We might want to go a step further and say, actually, we're not going to count these things as being consistent unless also all the tests actually pass when you run them. We could go even further and say, and we also want there to be some kind of coverage criterion which is met. In different circumstances, any one of these choices might be the most useful definition of consistency to be using. The more stringent your definition, of course, the more information you have, the more it tells you if you know that your models are indeed consistent. But on the other hand, you have less flexibility. For example, you might decide that your models are only consistent if an 85% branch coverage criterion is met. And there might be a good reason why it can't be in certain circumstances, and that then might give your developers a problem. Of course, the more stringent your consistency relation is, the more difficult it is to restore consistency, and that's particularly a concern if you're restoring consistency automatically, programmatically. But against that, the more work is potentially saved for the user if you can do it. Thinking about choosing how much consistency restoration to automate, here are some valid choices. It is a valid choice to say we're not going to automate consistency restoration at all. So perhaps we want to do automatic checking, but we want to reserve all the work of fixing consistency to be done by humans. And from a certain perspective, this is the kind of books we have now. So normally when you run your JUnit tests, you expect to get feedback on whether they pass, but you don't expect any automatic help in making them pass if they don't. The most of the book's research community mostly considers fully automatic consistency restoration, partly because that tends to be easier to reason about theoretically. But practical books languages, QVTR for example, tend to admit that sometimes consistency restoration will actually fail, and so you have to be able to allow the consistency restoration mechanism to just give up under certain circumstances. A possibility which I think deserves more attention than it has had so far um, is that there's some mileage in having consistency restoration which will automatically restore the easy parts of consistency but leave some tricky decisions where there's perhaps a choice about how to restore consistency for humans. Um, and that down there is one paper that addresses the issue. By the way, I'm only going to give references on slides to my own papers. Obviously, in them you'll find related work sections that talk about other people's papers. So when we talk about, bi about bidirectionality for integration of concerns, there are several levels at which we can do it. We're already doing bidirectional thinking in a certain respect if we're thinking about consistency explicitly at all. Going on to programming the checking or restoration of consistency, we can perfectly well do that in a general purpose language. And indeed, in bidirectional situations today, that's often what's done. For example, if you use round trip engineering in your UML tool that will restore consistency between the UML model and some Java code, it's probably programmed under the hood in a general purpose language. But in many ways, more interesting is to think about programming bidirectionally in a special purpose books language. Let's think for a moment about how to write books in a GPL. You can have one program to check consistency. So it will have type m cross n to bool, where m and n are the types of the models concerned. For example, our function may take a UML model and a Java system 
and give you true if they're consistent and false otherwise. Then you can have completely separate programs to restore consistency. One way of doing it would be to say, well, I'm going to have as arguments models from the respective model sets, and I'm going to have one function that will construct a revised version of the UML model that will be consistent with the Java system I started with. We say we'll modify the UML model to make it consistent. Dually, we might have a function that will leave the UML model alone and construct a revised version of the Java system that's consistent with it. These tasks are tightly coupled, however, so it's helpful to integrate their automation. That lets you avoid duplication of information, for example, about the structure of the models we're working with. And even more interestingly, it gives us a starting point to try to guarantee sensible joint behavior of the checking and the restoration functionality. And so, when we talk about a books program, what we mean is something which records in one artifact how to check and how to restore consistency. What would a great books language be like? What properties would it have? Well, in the beginning, w there was the view update problem. And one of the earliest examples of a books language was Harmony, developed by Nate Foster and Benjamin Pierce. And that enabled people to program a special subset of books known as lenses. So what's special about it? Well, what's special about it is we have not just any old pair of models, but a pair of models where we have a view, which is a strict abstraction of a source. And so a mapping from a source to a view simply involves throwing away some information. This might be, for example, querying a database. So typically the S would be the entire database and the V would be the subset of the database information that you query out of it. And when S abstracts to V, that's what we mean by saying that S is consistent with V. Of course, there might be several different sources which are consistent with the same view. If you have two sources which differ only in information which is abstracted away by this view abstraction function. Therefore, if we change S to S prime, restoring consistency is easy. We simply have to reapply the abstraction function. Going the other way is not so easy. If we have a V primed, perhaps it's a modified version of V, and we want to get back to a source in some sensible way, well, the thing we get back to better be consistent with V'. primed. In other words, it had better be a thing which itself would abstract to V'. prime. But we don't just want any old thing that would abstract to V'. prime. We'd really also like back what was abstracted away. OK. And of course, we can't do that unless we have some extra information going back the way, because that abstracted away information was just gone. OK. But if we say we're going to take as arguments to that direction of the consistency restoration, not just the modified view, but also what we might think of as the original source, then we can construct a modified source which restores the information that was abstracted away. And this lets us get, in addition to correctness, a very important property called Hippocraticness, which basically says, if in fact we didn't make any change to the view, we had v primed equals v, then when we restore consistency, we should find that we don't need to make any change to the source, s primed equals s. In model-driven engineering, however, it's more convenient to think symmetrically, partly because we're almost always working with models that conceptually overlap, rather than one being a strict abstraction of the other, and partly because, as I showed a few slides ago, we would like to choose how stringent the consistency relation we use is going to be, and therefore it helps to have the consistency relation explicitly front and centre in our formalisation of the books. And so what we do in this setup is we say everything's going to take place with respect to a consistency relation, which is just a relation on a pair of model sets, M and N, that specifies when an M and an N are considered to be consistent. And then we have a pair of consistency restoration functions. So this one on the right up here is read R forward, and it says, given an M and an N, construct a new version of the right-hand one, a new version of N. The other one is read R backwards, and it says, given an M and an N, construct a new version of the left-hand one, of M. And the idea is that each of these consistency restoration functions must at least be correct. 
They really do restore consistency. They really do return you a model which is consistent with the other model that you were given as an argument. And they must be Hippocratic. If you give them arguments that are already consistent, then they must simply return you the argument of the correct type. They must not propose any changes at all. And then those three things together, the consistency relation and the forward and backwards consistency restoration functions, form a books. Now, we've already made an important choice here. In this formalization, we've chosen to say that one model is going to be authoritative. At each consistency restoration, one of the models is not allowed to change. And so informally, what's going on here is that the model which is not allowed to change, its consistency relevant information overwrites any corresponding information in the other model. Sometimes that's not the optimal thing to do. Sometimes it's better to think about a synchronization approach in which both models change. However, I'm not going to talk about that much today. Correctness and Hippocraticness are only part of what we want from a good books. So the next few slides are going to be about a collection of properties called undoability. So let's quickly consider this sequence of model edits and consistency restorations, and then I'll show you a real example in a moment. So if M and N are the states of the models when we come in, somebody edits N to M prime, and then we restore consistency, thereby changing M to M prime. And now somebody puts N prime back to where it was before, to N, and we restore consistency again. Where do we get? What's the relationship between question mark and M where we came in? Well, if you expect that question mark and M are the same, that means you expect some kind of undoability. You expect to be able to make a change to N prime and undo it, and you expect really to get back to where you started. The key thing I didn't tell you, are we assuming that M and N are consistent to start with? If you're assuming that, you have a relatively weak property that we call undoability. And if you're not, if you think M and N might be arbitrary, then you have a stronger property that we might call strong undoability. For historical reasons, it's also known, better known these days, as history ignorance. Unfortunately, either of these properties is too much to expect. Here's an example that may help you understand why that is. So go back to our Java J unit example. I'm illustrating our Java code in UML, but that's OK. Think about it as Java. So when are we going to consider a bunch of Java classes and a bunch of JUnit classes to be consistent? Let's say they're going to be consistent provided whenever I look at a Java class, like customer, I can answer the question, is there a test for this class, with yes. And what we mean by being a test for this class is that there's some JUnit class whose name has the form test and then the class name and then a number. There should be at least one of those, OK? and vice versa. If I look at any of the JUnit classes whose names have that special form, test, string, number, then the string concerned is indeed the name of a class on the Java side. Now notice that that means we're not bothered if there are also JUnit test classes whose names don't have that special form. That's fine. That doesn't impact consistency. And note also that it's perfectly fine if we have more than one JUnit class for a given class on the other side. This is kind of typical. There's quite a bit of flexibility. So that's our consistency relation. Now, suppose our newbie developer comes along and accidentally deletes class account and restores consistency, propagates the change. The result is, has to be, that in order to restore consistency, those two JUnit classes that were there to test the account class, which is now gone, have to be deleted. Ah, oops. Our newbie now realizes her mistake and puts the account class back and restores consistency. But she doesn't get back to where she started because that test account now had to be automatically regenerated using just the information in the models on each side. So we've lost the information that originally there were two classes for testing account. And even worse, if there was actually content in there about what the tests were, that too has gone. So in other words, we're not in an undoable situation here. And fundamentally what's going on is that the consistency-relevant information, 
the names of the classes and the names that appeared in those tests, was stuck to other information, like how many tests there were, and maybe even what was actually in the tests. And therefore, when it was changed, there was other information that was lost. Now, I don't think I really have time to go through this, which is a shame, but I will just say we can formalise what it means to be consistency-relevant information by means of these two equivalences. So we can have a tilde f, which says that two models are going to be consistent if there are no differences between m and m prime that still remain visible after you restore consistency with respect to something on the n side, because their consistency-relevant information the information in them that's of interest to somebody working on the n side is the same already. And then we have a different equivalence relation, which is that we regard m and m prime as being equivalent if all the differences between them are visible on the n side. In other words, if we overwrite their consistency relevant information using a model from the n side, we have, it turns out, overwritten all the differences between them, and so then they become the same. Hopefully the characterizations I've put in the shaded boxes there make it pretty intuitive that it turns out that two models are identical if and only if they are equivalent according to both of these equivalence relations. And what that means is that we can use them to give coordinates for the model space by picking transversals for those two equivalence relations. Of course, everything works dually for n. So, if we have a set which includes exactly one representative of each tilde f equivalence class, then we can take an arbitrary m and we can identify the unique element of the tilde f transversal such that m is tilde f equivalent to it. And similarly, we find the unique element of the tilde b transversal such that m is tilde b equivalent to it. And we can think of that as specifying the coordinates of M in a two-dimensional grid. Now, because of that property on the previous slide, any position in this grid contains, at most, one element. But it's perfectly possible for a position in the grid to contain no element at all. That would happen if I picked an MF and an MB, such that there was no model that was simultaneously tilde F equivalent to MF and tilde B equivalent to MB. And that can happen and indeed normally does happen. And it turns out that these capture the behaviour of the elements of the books in a useful way. So consistency depends only on the MF and the NB components of our models. Those parts give the consistency relevant information. In the Java J unit case, hopefully it's reasonably intuitive that what we're saying is that the consistency relevant information is the names involved. So the tilde F equivalence class of M is given by the set of class names that occur in the Java model, and the tilde B equivalence class of the J unit tests is given by the set of names that appear in the J unit classes having those th that special form. Turns out forward consistency restoration depends only on the F components and backward consistency relation depends only on the B components, and I'm going to skip over that technical guff underneath. But the nice thing is that it turns out that what you end up with is a technical characterization of under what circumstances we have this nice strong undoability property, which amounts to saying that the consistency relevant information is not too tied up with the rest of the information. As it turns out that our books is strongly undoable if and only if M and N are full with respect to R, which is to say each square in the coordinate grids is filled with exactly one model. And it also tells us that the grid columns and rows are stabilized in an appropriate sense. Let's never mind that. This amounts to saying that the information relevant to consistency is independent of the rest of the information, and that's a lovely position to be in. But it's not often so. so we already saw in the Java J unit case that it wasn't so. So because, for example, the information about what names there were in the tests was tied up with other information, such as how many tests there were and what the test information was. And so, in particular, a book's language that enforced that property would be too inexpressive. It's a lovely property. You can't have it. More lovely properties you can't have. We intuitively have some notion of there being a size of a change. And intuitively, we would like to say 
our consistency restoration process is never going to make bigger changes than is strictly necessary for restoring consistency. There are two different ways of formalising that. We can say a small change on one side only causes a small change on the other. Or you can have something that's more like continuity and say if you are concerned to limit your exposure to change on one side, you can do that by limiting the amount of change on the other side. Those are slightly subtly different. Again, it turns out to matter quite a lot whether or not you assume you're starting from a consistent point. That matters for practical use because in practice the whole point is that we've got different stakeholders working independently on their models. So the other side doesn't stop working on their model just because you're working on yours. So this suggests that you probably want the strong versions of these properties. The weak versions may not buy you very much. So, problems with books and with trying to write world-beating books languages. Lenses are not enough because each side has information that's not present on the other. Strong undoability is not something you can insist on because in practice information relevant to consistency is interdependent with the rest of the information. You can't do things naively by putting metrics on your model spaces because what the right metric is depends quite strongly on your perspective. And it turns out, I haven't given you an example of this actually, you may not, um, you may not want least change with respect to it anyway. Um, I do have an example of that at the end if you want one. And by the way, if you're interested in complexity, um, computing metric least change consistency restoration is in a reasonable formalization, NP hard, and all that's in the paper I just mentioned. So in other words, summary of part two, it's fun to write down properties you'd like your books to have, but you can't have them. Different books languages are good at different things and in different ways. We're not likely to come up anytime soon with one true consensus language to use. And so in practical terms, if we're to make progress on this, we need our books languages or formalisms to be able to interoperate in settings with lots of different models that may be related by books in different languages. OK, so now the rest of the talk is going to be about the implications of that observation. There are lots of other problems to books that I could have talked about. So here's a picture I had a lot of fun drawing about some of the areas that need work in bringing bidirectional transformation technology to full usefulness in software engineering. I'm really only going to talk about the red stuff. So going beyond two models, we would like to be able to restore consistency in collections of models, so collections of representations of concerns, when any of them changes. And here's a toy, but not quite trivial, example mega model. A mega model, and that's just a model in which the models are themselves models, uh, the nodes are themselves models, and the edges are expressing the relationships between the models. And so what's going on here is we've got Java J unit as before. And just for fun, I've made that a ternary relationship now, involving also a safety model. So the idea is, it might be that the current state of a safety model, specifying perhaps whether our system is considered to be safety critical or not, might itself affect um, the desired consistency relation between the Java and the J unit. For example, perhaps we're concerned to ensure a coverage criterion if and only if the system we're building is currently modeled as being safety critical. At the top, we've got a design model, maybe in something like UML. Um, and our UML model perhaps has to conform to the UML meta model. And I've made some of these models authoritative, that's black, to indicate that we're not going to allow those models to be automatically changed by our consistency restoration process. There might be two reasons for that. It might be that we simply don't have the authority to change the model, ever. It's not much use restoring consistency between the UML model and the UML meta model by changing the UML meta model, because we don't have the power to do that. And in other circumstances, it might be that we just temporarily want a model to be considered to be authoritative, to be unchangeable. Perhaps the customer has just signed it off and it's not convenient to change it. So, we can formalize a consistency restoration problem with respect to such a mega model. We can say, given some models, some of them authoritative, not to be changed, 
connected by some binary books. So each box is going to incorporate its consistency relation and its consistency restoration functions. Find a sequence of applications of the binary books's consistency restoration functions that restores all the consistency relations. We'll call the entire network consistent if all of its edges are consistent. The bad news is that's mostly impossible. Why? Well, what might go wrong? Well, it might be that there simply is no solution. It might be that you have authoritative models that incorporate fundamentally contradictory decisions, such that there's nothing you can do in the models you're allowed to change that renders the entire network consistent. It might be that there is a solution, there is a collection of models that would form an entirely consistent network, but you can't reach it by means of any sequence of the consistency restoration functions you have. Even if you do have a solution and you can reach it, we probably don't have confluence. It may well be that there are multiple consistent solutions, if there are any at all, and the way in which you choose to restore consistency, the order in which you apply the book's consistency restoration functions, may determine which solution you reach. But even more interestingly, it may be that you have books which are almost able to do it, and this tends to be what happens when you think about any practical situation. So for example, the one we have here, you may want to say, well, suppose th that I could apply the commercial consistency restoration that will allow me, to allow me to update the Java with respect to the UML, and then I could apply some special comment to some of the resulting Java code, and then I could apply the consistency restoration function that I got from somewhere else to restore consistency with the JUnit, and then I'd be there. And so that's something we're going to think about using David Wheeler's law. All problems in computer science can be solved by adding another level of indirection. Instead of using our book's consistency restoration functions directly, we're going to invent this idea of a builder. The builder is going to encapsulate the intelligence required to build, bring a model automatically into consistency with a specified collection of its neighbours. It will do whatever is necessary. It might simply need to invoke one or more books, and it will encapsulate the order in which the books are invoked if there's more than one of them, and it might even need to invoke the books more than once. It might need to do some fixing up. It might even do something more interesting. It might interact with a user. It might do some search, some AI stuff. doesn't matter, provided that in the end the builder fulfills its contract. It either restores consistency along the edges it was asked to restore consistency along, or else it fails. That's all very well, but what's going to invoke the builders? Well, to make progress on this, we observe that restoring consistency in a network of models is very much like building a software system from some sources. And that allows us to adapt the Pluto build system by Sebastian Erdbecker and colleagues, which gives us proven soundness and optimality in appropriate senses, with some nice properties like dynamic dependencies and early cutoff, which I don't have time to explain. Um, and things like custom stamps, which capture what the, c the consistency relevant information is. Has some consistency releva relevant information changed, in which case some restoration may be needed, or not, in which case we may know without doing any checking that all is well. I'm just going to talk about two key decisions hit there. So one key decision is to pull rather than push. So earlier work had the form that you would change your model and each time you changed your model, those changes would be pushed through the network of models and would cause corresponding changes in the other models as necessary. But that's rather disruptive and it causes unnecessary work. So you can imagine, especially if you're going to make a sequence of small changes to a model, you really don't want every change pushed individually through the network straight away. It seems to make more sense instead to do something a lot more like what you do in a software build system, which is to say, select a target and rebuild only those parts of the network that are required to build that, tar that target up to date. So you decide which model you're going to work on. Maybe I'm a developer and I've turned up and I say, OK, I want to work on the JUnit. But maybe the JUnit is currently out of date with respect to other models in this mega model. So let's bring it into consistency with everything relevant to it. And that might, of course, involve updating those things with respect to their neighbours, if necessary. But anything that can be ignored, 
for example, anything that just depends on this J-unit model, will be ignored. And the second key decision is to use an orientation model. So we've observed that there's no hope of restoring consistency in a way which is independent of which models you're allowed to change and which will take priority if there's conflict. And so we do the next best thing. We provide an explicit, inspectable, familiar model to give control over those things. And that's an orientation model. So here I've used two different shades of colours to illustrate the difference between models which are always authoritative, where we're going to say we never want our consistency restoration process to change those, that's the safety and the MM model in black, and the design and the J unit models are just authoritative right now. And so what this or orientation model indicates is that on the next consistency restoration run, restoring consistency to the Java model, uh, we will only change the Java model by bringing it into consistency with the design and the JUnit models. In order to use Mega Model Pluto, that's the name of the adaptive, adapted framework that I've developed the beginnings of, you have to do fundamentally three things. You have to design your Mega Model, you have to specify what your models are and what the relationships are between the models. You have to create an orientation model which, as we just saw, is just another model. Your users change it. Probably your project manager changes it. You don't want multiple users changing it independently. And it lives in your configuration management system. And then, for each model that you might want to be able to build automatically, you write a builder. The framework provides a skeleton for writing the builder. But, of course, this is a skilled job. This is something we're still going to need skilled software developers to do. But once those things have been written, the system as a whole can ensure that people can bring their models into consistency with their neighbours without having to concern themselves with details of how consistency restoration is done. Lots of future work needs doing. So, for example, I would like to, I want to get some students to do this next year actually, to integrate existing model transformation engines so that builders can use those kind of as the building blocks of the builders themselves. And I'd like to be able to automatically generate custom stamps using those equivalence relations that I talked about in part two. I'm in the process of doing some work with James McKinna about mechanising the proof of correctness of these things, and that's particularly important when we do something else I'd like to do, which is to say exploring the horizons. So, for example, letting builders negotiate with their neighbours. You might want to say, OK, one of these models has to change. Which one has to change? Maybe the right answer is that the one that should change is the one where it's the middle of the night in the time zone of its developers, because that's less disruptive, or whatever. There are all kinds of possibilities there. Now, because the whole thing has to be allowed to fail, and we would like this to make sense even to people using these models who did not themselves program the consistency restoration, it's going to be important to be able to explain those failures, and that's very challenging. And, of course, this is only toy at the moment, and the $64,000 question is going to be, does it work in practice? But the prize is that in future, we might have a fundamentally different way of delivering software systems. So instead of having our developers talk to the stakeholders, understand their requirements, and deliver a fixed software system that they believe meets precisely the requirements of all the stakeholders, what we might do is to have our software specialists deliver something which is more like a cloud of potential software systems. In other words, a collection of domain-specific modelling languages with a starting model in each language. So you give to each set of stakeholders the language together with the starting model. And what you say is, the starting model captures what I think your requirements are right now, but the limits within which you can change your model without needing to pay me any more to come back to a specialist software developer is incorporated in this domain-specific modeling language. Okay? You can change those decisions by modifying the model within the language. And then you press this button, which will apply the bidirectional transformations to bring your model into consistency with the rest of the system. And that would give us a better separation between the tasks that really need to be done by the superhumans, the very clever computer scientists, and the tasks that fundamentally affect the behaviour of the software system, but might be done by people who don't even consider themselves software specialists at all. So that's the prize. So in conclusion, bidirectionality is about integrating separated concerns by maintaining consistency 
between their representations. And this is a difficult thing to do with lots of work that still needs to be done. I think we're looking at decades work here, not years. But I do think this holds out the prospect of a new way to develop software which may in the end mitigate the software capacity crisis. I'll put up that picture again in case you or your students might like to work on any of those things. And before I ask for questions, let me give two shameless plugs. So the first one is relevant to what I've been talking about, which is to say that Stefan Schaller at King's College London and I have recently heard that we've been successful in obtaining funding for a model-driven engineering network to start shortly. Um, to bring together academics and industrial practitioners to share expertise about um, current model-driven engineering technologies and about where new work is needed. And so if you might be interested in signing up for that, see my web page next month or so. And less relevantly is this book I've got coming out in a couple of weeks now, which is written for beginning programming students in universities, and I hope will be especially useful to students who may be about to get less hands-on help than they would in a normal year, and therefore perhaps particularly relevant in this pandemic year. So if you're teaching first year programming, or you know somebody who is, maybe that might be of interest to you. Now, questions?